All right, ladies and gentlemen, our second speaker of the evening. He grew up right here in the Triangle area, started bartending 12 years ago, and now he's the beverage director at Lawrence Barbecue and Lagoon Bar right over there at Boxyard RTP. Please welcome to the stage, Zach Thomas. Hello. My name is Zach, and I'll be your server, I mean speaker today. And I'm really sorry if you came here to see my chin. <laughs> uh, thanks, Wade, for the wonderful introduction, my man. Uh, I've worked at a bunch of places around the Triangle, and uh, fortunately enough, I've been able to pick up a few techniques and different tactics, maybe food science, um, along that way. Um, but before I get into that, I'd just like to clear something up. I'm in no way a psychologist, nor am I claiming to be a psychologist. Um, but I will say that I have served enough people and talked about their problems behind the pine enough to consider myself like a part-time shrink. <laughs> um, and through my guests, I've also learned the kinds of drinks that I can serve them and how I can deliver that to them. Uh, before I get into that, though, I'd like to talk about the dude that pretty much taught me everything I need to know. Uh, it's my dad. He, uh, he's also a bartender. He still bartends to this day. I grew up um, chopping lemons, running ice to as well, and watching him talk to guests and make them feel really happy and smile, which is, at the root, exactly what we're supposed to be doing. Um, he's of the mind that as long as you give the guest exactly what they're looking for in that moment, they can have no reason to complain whatsoever. Um, and he focuses everything he can on the element of service. Um, because to quote him, a smile makes up for a lot of mistakes, and in this industry, uh, you can't help but make them sometimes. <laughs> Good joke. <laughs> Anyways, um, he taught me that all you need to know to be a successful bartender is to make folks feel welcome and to make them a little bit happier than when they walked into the door. And I love that thought, and it's exactly what I tell everybody when I train them to be bartenders behind the bar. But when you step into the role of like a bar manager, a bar consultant, or a beverage director, you have to start taking other aspects of the business into consideration to make sure that that one-on-one -on -one hospitality that they're receiving is translated throughout every part of your concept. Um, and I found that that mostly lies in the product as well as the environment. Those are the two main avenues to express that hospitality. Um, so that being said, let's talk about the product a little bit. Um, on several occasions, I've had guests come up to me and ask me for specs on my drinks. Um, they'll go home, they'll make it, and they'll be s like sorely disappointed and they'll come back and say, you know, your bar makes it the best um, and they just give up on their dreams on the glamorous and opulent life of a cocktail bartender. <laughs> And uh, I'm here to say that the dream can live on and that we're looking for folks to hire across the way at Lagoon. So after the show, hit me with them resumes. <laughs> um, anybody can follow a recipe, um, but just like in the kitchen with chefs, it takes a proper bartender uh, with proper training to make a proper drink. Um, in the end, the main difference falls on the two final, uh, two final elements. It's the quality of the ingredients and the technique that they're taught. Um, and hopefully after this, I've shared a few tips to where all you guys can have some really nice drinks on some kitchen countertops real soon. Um, so with regards to ingredients, more often than not, out of all the ingredients you could be using, the main culprit for a good versus bad drink is going to be ice. Um, I could go on about that for hours. I love ice. I think it's a really fun topic. But, um, but I know it sounds super boring. But... Uh, but what it essentially boils down to is the ice that you're putting in your freezer absorbs all the smells that are in that freezer. So like frozen peas and chicken breasts and the casserole you forgot about, that's all in the ice that you're putting in your beverage. Um, so real quick fix, just spray that thing out, fill it full of new water, put it in a Ziploc bag, boom, fixed. That's your ice problem. Um, the other thing that separates a good home cocktail from a bad one is the technique that you're utilizing. And a lot of people don't know this, but shaking and stirring do two different things to a drink. Um, stirring and shaking both chill and dilute your beverage. Um, stirring is a lot more of an elegant and a pretty way of making a drink. But what shaking does is it starts to incorporate air into the beverage. And uh, 
on a very, very food science-y, microscopic level, food science. Um, it's attaching small bubbles to micro debris, and it's making a really fluffy, lively texture. So at the end of the day, if you don't know whether to stir or shake a beverage, uh, just remember the old adage. It's not so old, but if it's opaque, you shake. It's just that easy. You know, if it's like a Tom Collins, you want to shake it. You don't want to stir a Tom Collins. Unless you're in the UK, that's how they do it out there. Shout out UK. Um, <clears throat> uh, that's pretty much, pretty much what technique boils down to. And you can tell a good bartender from a bad one when you walk into their bar. It takes a lot for them to gain confidence in that ability. Um, and they're kind of like the knife skills that chefs have, but with cocktail bartenders. So if you are testing a bartender, if any of you guys are going to be training bartenders anytime soon, get them to whip up a daiquiri, get them to stir a Manhattan, and uh, see how they strain them. That's a really big deal, too. You don't want big old ice chunks floating in a daiquiri. It tastes horrible. <clears throat> uh, the other thing that we talked about was the environment. Uh, thank you guys so much for bearing with me. Appreciate you, Wade. <laughs> um, and the environment pretty much boils down to two aspects. It's cleanliness and the organization of the bar. Cleanliness is pretty obvious. If you see a table that's really sticky, if you see just glasses sitting around the place, more often than not, that visual cue is going to be able to tell you what kind of service you're going to be receiving. Uh, it's going to be kind of last minute, not really thought of. Um, but there are some places that take that uh, relationship and they flip it. So there's this place in Houston called Anvil. Uh, it's one of my favorite bars in the United States. Um, they have a brass bar top. And uh, before every single shift, and I worked at Pullen Park for like seven years, and I know polishing brass can be kind of a daunting task. The bartenders will take a buffer, and they'll buff out all the stains on the bar top. And what that does to them, and what uh, Bobby Hugel, who owns that bar, his um, philosophy behind that is that it's the first thing that the guest sees when they walk into the space, and it's the first kind of test you can pass to show them that you actually care about what you're doing. Um, the other element that I learned a lot about is uh, the spacing of a place. Um, so with COVID, six feet apart, um, it teaches you how to, uh, the amount of space that somebody needs to not just uh, one, feel safe, but number two, like how to socialize and feel comfortable around another person. Um, some places don't really have as much of a control over that as others. Um, but what I will say is I worked in a tiny basement bar for a bunch of years, and uh, I will say that they do have control over the amount of people that they allow into their space. So if you walk into a space and it's crowded, you're not going to get the best service, which is what it boils down to. <laughs> Thank you. So I'm going to wrap it up. Uh, <laughs> there's a lot that goes into the decisions a bartender makes um, that lead to what kind of service you're going to be receiving. Um, we're all in luck, though, because most of the cocktail bars you'll walk into around the triangle are aware of these things, and they'll go to great lengths in their own way to show you that their experience matters, that your experience matters to them. Some of my favorite places are the Crunkleton in Chapel Hill, great spot. Uh, Foundation in Raleigh, really great spot. Bar Virgil in Durham, really awesome spot to get great cocktails. Um, and I'll just close it out with a sentiment from my mentor, Gary. Gary Crunkleton, no relation. I'm just kidding. <laughs> he said that we're not as much in the drink making business as we are the people business. And uh, with that being said, I look forward to getting to know everybody across the way at Lagoon um, and getting to know my people. Um, and in the spirit of like a TED talk, I have to ask a question and it's audience engagement. Um, so are you feeling happier now? No? Okay, well, okay, well. I guess I know what I'm talking about. I was, I was really planning on just saying, oh, well, but nice. <laughs> That's all I got. Thanks, Wade. <laughs>
specifically because of that. Um, it's a point of contention in the bartending world, and it really doesn't take that much energy to make a mojito. It's just that somebody told bartenders to hate it, and now everybody hates it. You know, it's a really, really easy drink to make. <laughs> but, uh, but it's because uh, bartenders are also like part-time like superstars, and they're also prima donnas, so uh, they'll just find a reason to be upset. <laughs> Not me, of course. All right, next question over here to your right. Thank you, Zach. Yeah. Um, so you talked about ice grabbing all of those freezer flavors. Have you ever used that to your advantage to make like an herb ice or something to make an ever-evolving drink? Man, these are just the best questions. Thank you so much. I, uh, I actually discovered recently I've been working on how to make clear ice um, with a cooler. So if you guys don't know how to make clear ice, you get a... Uh, you get a, just a plastic cooler from Walmart, and uh, it's the concept of directional freezing. Um, it essentially, five sides are insulated, one side is not insulated, and it creates clear ice by pushing all the air and the impurities out of the bottom of it. And if there's the smallest amount of debris, it'll start to frost up and it won't look that great. But I found recently that if you put cucumbers in it and let it rest, it'll taste like cucumbers. So, uh, and it's crystal clear. So yes, I, I absolutely have, and I, I love it so much. Thank you for asking that. <laughs> that's such, that's so wild. Do you follow my Instagram or something? Or <laughs> that's Science. really awesome. All right, next question over here to your left. Hi, um, another specific drink question. Like, why do so many bars use sour mix in their margaritas when that, I, I think that kind of makes it too bitter. Yeah. <laughs> The real short of it is that they're cheap, and, <laughs> and, and they don't recognize the importance of fresh ingredients, you know? Um, sour mix has, uh, you know, it, almost an indefinite, I mean, I don't, I'm not a, I don't know, food processing. But, uh, but uh, to their belief, it's an indefinite shelf life, you know? I've walked into some bars that I've consulted before, and I've, like, literally dusted them off the sour mix. So uh, if you want to make a sour mix at home, it's really, really simple. It's... Uh, it's one part lemon juice, one part lime juice, one part orange juice to three parts uh, sugar and water. Um, and it makes a great sour mix. Um, fresh juice, though, is kind of the, the pivoting point in the early uh, 1990s from this guy named Dale DeGroff in New York. Um, he introduced that at a place called the Rainbow Room, and it kind of revolutionized cocktails. So uh, that was actually the pivoting ingredient that switched everything for the cocktail world. So thank you. All right, and our last question will be over to your right. Hi, great talk. Um, I'm actually a big fan of John Taffer's Bar Rescue. Nice. And I had a question, what do you think about his methods for saving a failing bar, and what do you actually think about John Taffer? Yeah, nice. Uh, I love that show, man. It's a great show. Uh, John Taffer himself is uh, kind of a dinosaur in this industry. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but I think he knows what he's doing, and especially the people that he's consulting for. There was a bar in Raleigh called Cashmere on Glenwood Ave that he turned into Duel, and uh, it you know, almost doubled and tripled in profits within the first year. So the man absolutely knows what he's doing. Um, the thing is, like, uh, he tries to apply a lot of volume concepts to craft environments, and that sometimes doesn't work, but, but overall, I, I love that guy. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, big hand for Zach. Thanks, y'all. Come on.